Over the past several decades, global travel has really become more accessible to more people than ever before in human history. Because of aircraft and a key technology which is at the heart of aircraft, which is the propulsion system, today you can get anywhere you like in the world. If you book in advance or catch a good deal, you can even do it relatively cheaply. You can get from London to Sydney in 600 pounds return. You can get from Europe to the east coast of North America in 300 pounds return. And the growth in travel and trade that has resulted because of aerospace and aviation have caused this industry to grow at two times the rate of global GDP. This growth is expected to continue, and over the next 20 years, the number of aircraft in the sky will increase manyfold. But unfortunately, all of this comes at a cost. <coughs> a key negative externality of aviation is its impact on global warming. Carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and even cirrus cloud effects are all various drivers of how aviation impacts the world. Looking specifically at carbon dioxide, as recently as 2016, estimates suggested that there were one trillion tons of CO2 being spewed out into the atmosphere just because of aircraft. And this is despite decades of work by really capable engineers, scientists all around the world trying to make this industry more efficient through evolutionary improvements. When we modeled what would happen with these evolutionary improvements and charted it out until 2050, because of all the growth that we're expecting in this industry over the next 30-odd years, this number is expected to quadruple to 3.8 trillion tons. So these evolutionary improvements may not be enough. What I'm here to talk about today is a potential revolutionary change, and that's known as electrical propulsion. Not only does this new technology hold the promise to significantly help us with the climate question, it also has a number of other benefits that it can create for aerospace, but also directly for us who are consumers of this industry. So I'd like to just have a round of hands, if that's OK. Three questions for the audience. Please put your hands up if you agree with any of them. So question number one, as we know, aircraft are relatively safe. But who would want to see their aircraft become even safer? Please put your hands up. OK, that's pretty much everyone in the audience. Thank you. Question number two, who would want their aircraft to be less noisy than they are at the moment? OK, slightly fewer hands, but still most of the audience. And I'd venture a guess that if you live below the flight path of one of these aircraft taking off from an airport, you probably would put your hand up. Final question. Who would want their airline tickets to be even cheaper than they've already become today? OK, that's, that's almost everyone once again. Thank you very much. This technology really does have the potential to help us with all of these other issues as well. So over the next few slides, next few minutes, I'd like to walk through what exactly electrical propulsion is. Please forgive me. It's going to be a little bit of a science lecture. Next, I'll go through exactly what people are already doing about it. And finally, I'll get into some of the barriers that we need to overcome before this can really be a reality. So let's get into it. What is electrical propulsion? Let's start off with a typical aircraft many of you will have flown in. So an Airbus A320 or a Boeing 737. This is the kind of aircraft you use for a journey, for a short hop. Let's say London to Rome or Boston to Chicago, that kind of journey. And this is obviously powered by some form of fuel. Today, that's aviation fuel, and that's stored within the wings. And it's funneled into the engine. Now, this engine is an incredibly complex bit of kit, a marvel of engineering. 25,000 rotating parts of metal, composite, ceramic, all with the sole intention of burning aviation fuel in as efficient a way as possible. 
The fuel is burned in the middle of the engine in what's known as a combustion chamber. And through a mechanical connection that runs right through the middle of the engine, it rotates a fan at the front. That fan then, in turn, gives you the propulsion that gets you to your destination. This is where the new technology comes in. Because of advances in other industries, primarily the auto industry, we've learned how to make very efficient generators, very power-dense batteries, and also really efficient electric motors. We can plug those into this archetype, into this architecture, apologies. And what we've basically done now is we've created the Toyota Prius of aircraft engines. Some of the rotation is turned into electricity. That electricity is then stored in the battery, and it's used exactly when it's needed the most. So for example, if you want to reduce your takeoff distance, you just switch on that battery, and it plugs it in, and you have a little bit more thrust exactly when you need it. For those who are Formula One fans in the room, this is a little bit like a kinetic energy recovery system, a KERS device. And as a result, the whole system can be a little bit more efficient. You can also make the whole system a little bit cheaper by doing this, because you can size down the engine itself, because some of the power is now being shared with the battery. But let's keep going a little bit further. Now we've completely disembodied this engine. On the left-hand side, the fuel is still being burnt, but now its sole purpose is to generate electricity. On the right-hand side, that electricity is being used, stored in maybe a slightly larger battery, and then ultimately being used to propel the aircraft forward as it's designed to be. The key difference here is that we've lost that mechanical connection that we started with. Because of that mechanical connection, the original engine needed to be optimized in a constrained way. You needed the, the fan and the burning of the fuel to be optimized together. What we've done here is separated that. We've created a system in which the burning can be optimized separately and the propulsion can be optimized separately. And that holds the potential for the whole system to be a little bit more efficient as well. That's known as distributed propulsion. Let's bear that term in mind, because it'll come back in just a few minutes. Now, for smaller aircraft with shorter ranges, you can actually even anticipate that the whole thing could be replaced with a battery. But in general, in the future, it could even be hydrogen or solar, or maybe a combination of all these various fuel sources. So let's go back to our Airbus or Boeing-sized aircraft and see what this means. Because of the so-called distributed propulsion, what we've now got is the engine itself is embedded within the aircraft. It's connected to the propeller via just some cabling. Very advanced electrical cabling, mind you. It's not necessarily that simple. But it's a lot simpler than a mechanical connection. Now, this already brings significant benefits, because today those engines have to hang off the side of the wing and they have to be exposed to the elements. They have to be able to deal with a bird strike, with lightning strikes, with water ingestion, sand ingestion. And they need to be able to go from zero miles an hour to full, full speed ahead. If you embed the engine within the aircraft, you can put it in a much more controlled and serene environment. And so, today, those engines which are perhaps a little over-engineered can be more correctly designed for just the base use of generating electricity. And this is where it can now start getting really interesting and exciting for a propulsion system engineer. Because they can start thinking very creatively about where they place the propellers and where they place what's known as flow control devices. To be very clear, this actually has a direct impact on passenger experience as well. You can start managing that pesky turbulence in a more effective way. You can make the aircraft less noisy. And in being able to control the flow around the entire aircraft in this proper way, you can make the aircraft a lot more efficient as well without even changing the shape of the plane at all thus far. But we're not done. We have one more step to take. Because of electrical propulsion, we can finally enable brand new aircraft designs that have never made it into commercial use. This, for example, is a blended wing body. 
Now, you need a few other things also to come together, but this design, which has been in university classrooms and NASA research labs for decades, could be enabled by electrical propulsion, and it's significantly more efficient than the other aircraft that we are more used to flying. Taking all of these little steps into account, you can actually achieve up to 50% reduction in fuel consumption. And that translates directly to CO2, nitrous oxide, and all those other effects. And it actually translates also directly to your wallet. Today, about 40 to 45% of how much you pay for your ticket actually goes to pay for fuel, despite the relatively lower fuel prices that we're currently experiencing. If you can reduce fuel consumption, well, that means that your ticket could be a little cheaper as well. So now we've learned what electrical propulsion is and what the benefits could be. The fact is that there's a lot of people who also realize this. So let's take a look at what others are doing about it. We at Roland Berger, we've been looking at the number of electric aircraft that are flying and are being developed around the world today. There's 170 new types of aircraft under development today. That's about four times as many aircraft as currently fly in, in regular service. That's, a, that's, that's quite a few new ones. By the end of the year, our predictions suggest there could be something like 200. About half of these are startups, and the other half include major companies such as Airbus, Boeing, Rolls-Royce, because they all realize the potential of this new technology. Other companies that have fantastic electronics capabilities, such as Siemens, are also coming in to join the fray. So what kind of aircraft are they, are they, talking, are they talking about? About 1% are the large aircraft. That's at the Airbus and Boeing level, let's say. A large chunk are looking at regional aircraft. What that means is doing city-to-city -city hops, journeys that you typically would think about taking a train or a car for, you might be able to do in an aircraft in the future. And the final segment, which is the largest chunk, are flying cars. That's an exciting new idea. Let's take a look at what all these new technologies might actually look like. So at the larger commercial end of the spectrum, Here's a development by a company called Wright Electric in partnership with EasyJet. Both these companies really believe in a more sustainable aviation future. And as you can see, there's no engine hanging off the side of the wing. There's actually several propellers within the wing encased within, and 16 of them in total around the aircraft. That's distributed propulsion. This is powered by a battery, but also fuel on board. So once again, it's a hybrid aircraft concept. Let's take a look at another one. Here's, here's some developments by a company called Zunamero. The two aircraft in the foreground of the image are regional. They're a little bit smaller. But ultimately, these guys also want to go to the large commercial end. As you can see there, that's a very different shape. Three propulsors at the back and no engine anywhere to be seen. That's because the engine is once again embedded within the aircraft very similar to what we were talking about, and with all the benefits that we were discussing. Now let's go to the other end of the size spectrum. Here's a development by Airbus. That's a four-seater flying car. This would be, you know, a lot of you will think, well, maybe that's just a helicopter. Well, it's actually really, really different, because today helicopters are really only for a very niche audience, right? They're very expensive. They are only accessible to very few of us. And that's because of the maintenance burden, and that's because of their propulsion system. This is electrically propelled and has the potential to be accessible to many of us in the future, many more than certainly can be today. And on the slightly niche side of the flying car um, phenomenon, here's a development by Aston Martin and Rolls-Royce, very cool, something that maybe James Bond will use in this next movie. That's to be seen, let's see. Okay, so now we've seen what people are doing about it. We kind of get electrical propulsion. But I'd venture a guess that many of you are wondering how can one new technology have such a significant impact? Seems a little bit too much, seems a little far-fetched. The reality is that there's a lot of barriers to overcome. 
I'd like to share three with you today. The first is on technology. And we've talked quite a lot about batteries. Battery technology has actually been advancing really rapidly, once again because of the auto industry, as the electric vehicle boom occurs. However, we have a long way to go, because before it becomes relevant for the larger aircraft, which are, let's say, the Airbus and Boeing scale, the batteries would need to be two or maybe even three times as dense. The power to weight ratio has to go up significantly. And we don't yet know if there's any physical or chemical limits that would prevent this becoming possible. The second point, ooh, apologies, the second point is on policy. And that boils down to safety. Now today, as we mentioned earlier, aircraft are already pretty safe. Stepping into an aircraft is about 100 times safer than stepping into your own car. That's just how, how much safer they are. But that wasn't always the case. About 100 years ago, at the dawn of aviation, if you were an aviator, your profession probably had the lowest life expectancy. Because if you designed a plane and then tried to get into it and fly it, and it didn't work, you probably didn't live to tell the tale. Today, we've learned from our mistakes. We've learned so much that the regulations are incredibly stringent, but they allow us to close our eyes as passengers and get into a plane and be content to watch our movie and not be worried about our lives. The reality is we don't want that to change. There's great benefits in this new technology, but regulation will have to move at pace with the, with the technology to prevent these standards going down. Finally, there's demand, because ultimately, an airline has to be willing to pay for these aircraft, and passengers have to be willing to pay for their seats. And no new technology, which is so dramatically different, is cheaper on day one. There will have to be a little bit of patience in the market. Maybe that gap is bridged by subsidies or regulations, just like they have in the auto industry. But maybe airlines will step up and realize that there are other benefits, such as safety and reduced noise. And maybe that's how that, that, that gap will be bridged. That's yet to be seen. But a pessimist can always find a problem for every solution. So rather than dwelling on these, let's look at what the trends are. Technology is improving rapidly. Regulators are moving in the right direction. They've already recognized that this is coming, and they're moving to adapt for it. And airlines have already put up their hand and said that, yes, in the future, we will fly an electric aircraft. So now let's look at what the world could be like if this technology became, became possible and came into our lives. Certainly, we would see reduced greenhouse gases, chief of which is carbon dioxide. And as everyone was putting their hands up for just a few minutes ago, we would expect safer and quieter skies. Now, where we started with our world having become so deeply accessible already, we can expect this technology to make that even more so the case, with cheaper tickets for journeys that you already take and flying options when today you may rely upon ground transportation. Finally, going to the question once again of carbon dioxide, when we said there would be 3.8 trillion tons of CO2 that would be created to manage all the growth that we're hoping for in this industry, we can actually create the same growth, but if we insert electrical propulsion into the mix, that number reduces dramatically. And we'd still be able to get all the prosperity, all the global trade, all the global travel that's created because of aviation and all the growth that we're expecting in the future. So we get it. So there's a lot of questions to be answered, a lot of money to be invested, a lot of time that might be required. But I would humbly say that when something makes this much sense, it's not a matter of if it will come to pass, but when. Thank you.